Welcome to World Class Sunday School. Thank you so much for tuning in for our lesson today. I'm Diane Morgan. I am standing in for our Brother Dorsey. I hope you will enjoy our Sunday School lesson. The title of our lesson is, Empty Rituals Are Useless. The word ritual means a religious, a solemn ceremony that we consistently do in a series of a uh, certain times. There are certain times when we do certain things, so that's called a ritual. But there are certain rituals that we do that uh, today's lesson will let us know that they are useless rituals. Our lesson today is written by the prophet Isaiah. Our print passage is Isaiah, the 29th chapter, the 13th through the 24th verse. Our key verse they also that erred in spirit shall come to understanding, and they that murmured shall learn doctrine. Isaiah, the 29th chapter, and the 24th verse. So let me tell you a little bit about Isaiah. Isaiah is said to be one of the most prolific prophets in the Bible when it comes to writing verse. When he was called by God, it was the year that King Uzziah died. Isaiah responded with a cheerful readiness, though he knew from the beginning that his ministry would be filled with fruitless warnings and exhortation, meaning that he would be preaching the, preaching the gospel, he would be speaking to God's people, he would be pouring his heart out to the people, but many of them would pay him no heed. That's what it means to be fruitless. Exhortation means that he, he's pouring his heart out because Isaiah had a true love for God and a true love for God's word. Isaiah's writings take place during the time of five kings. So his, his writing was in, exist, in existence for quite a long time. The fifth king was named Manasseh. And Manasseh would be the king who would kill Isaiah. He would put him on a board and cut him in two. Imagine loving the Lord so much that you're willing to give your life. And that's what Isaiah did. That's a question that many of us might, might uh, want to ponder. Are we willing to love God so much that we are willing to give our life. So let's look into uh, to today's lesson. I do want to make mention that Isaiah was a contemporary of Hosea and Micah. And many of you may have studied about, uh, especially Hosea, and just how much he loved the Lord. Uh, he had a very trying time as a prophet, but he would be triumphant as well because God would give him the strength to endure his wife, Gomer. So many of us who are uh, studiers or readers or even listening to people who teach about the Bible have heard the story of Hosea and his wife. It is said that Isaiah's writing style had no rival, that he was so versatile and his words just flowed like poetry because he poured out his heart about what God had told him to do. God had given him the prophecy so that he would tell us that the Messiah was coming. We knew way before Jesus ever uh, set foot on this earth about his arrival because we read through uh, the book of Isaiah, it tells us that Jesus is coming. One of the things that I found interesting about the book of Isaiah is that it contains 66 chapters, just as our Bible contains 66 books. And uh, the, book, the, the book of Isaiah is divided in half. It has 39 uh, chapters in the first half and 27 chapters in the second half, just as our Bible does. So uh, I'm sure that's no mistake in his writing uh, that uh, he was given this prophecy and a peek into what the future would be like because God trusted him and knew that he would do his bidding without even giving it a thought. 
So what I'm going to do now is read you just a little bit of uh, Isaiah, uh, the 29th chapter, starting at the first verse. Our lesson doesn't start until the 13th verse, but I just wanted to read a little bit before we got there so you could have a little background on what is about to happen. So Isaiah 29 and 1 reads, Woe to Ariel, to Ariel, the city where David dwelt. The, the, the word Ariel refers to Jerusalem. Add ye here, add ye year to year. Let them kill sacrifices. So this means that uh, that they they would be giving fruitless service to God year after year. That they, they would do sacrifice just because that was something they did. It, it wasn't because they loved the Lord so well or because they were obedient or did as God instructed them to do. It was because that was what they always did. That was what their foreparents did. That was what they thought was the right thing to do. But as we go through our lesson, we'll learn that they were just doing it because that was what they did. That was what they were taught to do, and not because they truly worshiped and adored God any longer. Now, how many of you know that if, if you're in a relationship, uh, you're dating somebody or you're married to somebody, and all they do is say, I love you, but that's all they do. They, they never show any other form of love, but all they do is give you lip service. Honey, I love you. Baby, I love you. But they, they, they never do anything for you. We all like gifts. We all like to have someone spend some time with us. We like to go out on a date, go places, do things, be together. But if all they did in passing was say, I love you, you wouldn't believe that. And, and that's the way we do God. We say, God, I love you. And, and we say words unto God. But we don't truly give our heart to God. And God knows this because God is much smarter than we will ever be. And as we go through today's lessons, lesson we will understand what uh, Isaiah has to tell us about our useless rituals, our empty rituals that we do. Let's start by reading uh, some of our verses. So this is uh, Isaiah the 29th, starting at the 13th verse through verse 16. It says, the Lord said, because those people draw near with their mouths and honor me with their lips while their hearts are far from me. And their worship of me is a human commandment. Learn by rote. Rote is just like when we learned our alphabets, our ABCs, or our one, two, threes. We do it over and over again until we know it and it becomes common. If you remember when you were learning your alphabets and you were learning your numbers, you were excited. A, B, C, and one, two, three. We were excited we were learning something new. But after a while, as you got older, A, B, C, one, two, three became commonplace, didn't mean anything to you. Well, that's the same thing we do to God. We'll say our prayers, or uh, we'll go to church, or we'll even sing songs, and uh, they sound good, but we don't really mean it. We, we just do it because that's, a, that's customary and that's what we do all the time. Here it says, his people are disappointed because they provide perpetual lip service. Giving God the honor and respect that he is due is not what people tend to do. That we don't, we don't give him the honor and respect that we know he truly deserves. But we'll tell, us, we'll tell ourselves that until we see a homeless person and we cross the street without even so much as offering them a dollar or a cool drink because we say that that person might harm us, but we haven't even given ourselves the opportunity to reach beyond or reach out. Uh, we've got our Sunday clothes on, so uh, we don't have time for that person at this moment. So God is looking at us when we do that, and, and he knows that that, that that is not right. So it, it's important that we check ourselves that, that we make sure that we don't just do things because that's what we've always done. Verse 14, so I will again do amazing things with this people. This is God talking. 
he, he's, he's uh, talking through the prophet Isaiah. So I will again do amazing things with this people, shocking and amazing. The wisdom of their wise shall perish, and the discernment of the discerning shall be hidden. I imagine that. You, you may be uh, one of the people who uh, preaches from the pulpit, or you might be a Sunday school teacher, and all of a sudden, you don't know anything. That God has wiped away your memory, and God can do that. And that's what he's telling Isaiah to tell the people that, Right now you seem very smart, you're pompous, you're puffed up, but I can wipe, wipe away that. That means nothing to me. That means nothing to God when we treat him as if he is just commonplace, everyday, and ordinary. We, we have to be careful that we make sure that we continue to give God uh, ultimate respect and that we don't make him second place. It says, however, their proclamations are shallow because they are not authentic and sincere. We need to strive to make sure that every utterance of a prayer, every lesson that we teach, every song that we sing, every sermon that we preach, that it is authentic and sincere. Many times you hear people say, God knows my heart. And be assured, God does know your heart. It says, loving God must come from the heart and God acknowledges that he knows that the people have that have kept their hearts from him and his love isn't, isn't that something we keep our hearts from him and we keep our love from him so how do we expect God to love us if we don't love him that that, that, that that's something that we truly have to think about and ponder that God loves us unconditionally and he does but he does expect us to love him in return because God gives us his very best. And how reasonable is it for us to give him our very best? That, that's just a little bit to ask for someone who was willing to send their son to save our very lives from our sins. Verse 15, ha, huh. you who had a plan too deep for the Lord, whose deeds are in the dark, and who say, who sees us, who knows us. You know how people say uh, that they do things and they do it in the dark and don't nobody know but God? Yes, God does know. And that, that's what make, should make us tremble and fear, is that God knows what we do. He knows our little dirty deeds and our little dirty sins and we have to be very careful of that. That's what Jerusalem was guilty of. They were guilty of worshiping our gods. They were guilty of uh, marrying uh, pagan women, pagan men and God frowned on that and, and God is about to get tired of that. He keeps sending messengers to tell them to um, turn back, to turn from their wicked ways. And they continue to do that same thing. They laugh in the face of God. And we should be very, very, very scared to do that. that that's very wicked. And man's heart has become wicked at this time. And, but God keeps sending messengers. He keeps saying, I love you. But what do the people of uh, uh, Jerusalem do, the Israelites do? They continue to ignore the warnings. It's kind of like when your parents tell you, you, you better stop doing that. I'm going to get you. So it's important that we remember that God is only going to put up with our disobedience for so long till he will have to discipline us. And, and I assure you, we don't want God to discipline us. We, we've seen, even now during COVID-19, what discipline is like. And, and it's very, very tough. But we, we're also seeing how God is starting to allow things to change that we're starting to get back to some of our normal ways. But we better be careful that we, won't, we don't get back to too much normal. We don't fall back into empty, useless rituals. Verse 16, you turn things upside down. Shall the potter be regarded as the clay? Shall the thing made say of its maker, he did not make me? Or the thing formed say of the one who formed it, he has no understanding. Isn't that something? That the clay, which is used to make pottery, all, all, 
all of a sudden tells the potter, the person who forms the clay into that beautiful vessel, oh, you didn't make me. And, and that's basically what Isaiah is saying that we tell God. God made us, but we've gotten so smart that we're starting to tell God, you didn't make us. It's as if we think we made ourselves. And that is far from the truth. It says, when they gather for worship, everything seemed predictable because of their lack of authenticity. In other words, they had learned by rote, which is doing something over and over again, just because that's the way they always did it. But they, didn't, they did not understand to whom they were praying and why it was necessary. Do you ever think that when you go to church, what the order of worship is, that, that we open it up with maybe some quiet music as people gather, and then maybe the praise team will start to sing, and we'll, or we'll have prayer, and we'll have announcements and other things, then we'll have the word. Have you ever thought what it might be like if the, the, the pastor or whoever's gonna deliver the word just open up with service with, I'm going to pray and I'm gonna give you the word. They probably would make us shocked. What's going on here? But we observe rituals all the time in how our services are carried out. So sometimes we might ought to consider, let's do this, let's shake things up a little bit. Let's do this a little different. Let's just not do things just because that's the way we've always done them. So we have to be very careful that we don't put God into a cookie cutter pattern where we just do it and that's the way we always do it and we expect it to come out a certain way every time. That's just not the way God works. So why would God discipline his people if, if he loves us so much? That's the reason God disciplined us because he loves us so much. Otherwise we would be our own worst enemy. We, we would ut utterly destroy ourselves. It says uh, one of the reasons was that uh, the Israelites had learned to simply go through the motions of just doing things just because that's the way they always did it. And many times you can find on your job that they have to change how we do a certain process because we were doing it the way we always did it and time came when it didn't work any longer. So we have to find a new way to do it to make it better. So there are times even in our church services or our worship services that we have to do things different. And we, we've seen it firsthand with COVID that we had to do services different. We had to use social media. We had to use Zoom and Facebook and Instagram and uh, just plain old telephone just to get the message out and get the word out. So we really had to call on God and say, God, help us figure this out. And, and, and I'm sure God smiled because we had to go back to him. We had to do it the old fashioned way. So next it says, it is revealed that the Lord is contemptuous toward people's attitudes. Attitudes meaning that we, we, we harden our hearts that we don't show love like we should show love. So God has to deal with us. He has to discipline us. He has to uh, let us know that what you're doing is wrong and I would not tolerate it. He sends it through his messages and we do well to listen. It says, God's condemnation is on those that attempt to hide their plans deeply from the Lord. Imagine trying to hide something from God who is all knowing all present, all powerful, and us, mere man, mere woman, we're trying to hide things from God. It says this indicates that the people went to great land to conceal their schemes and deception from the eyes of God. They went to great lengths to conceal their schemes and their deception from the eyes of God. How, how could people be so full of themselves, so pompous, that they thought they could hide things from God. That, that certainly was a great error in judgment on their part. So this was a serious error in judgment, thinking that we could hide anything from God. Because God knows everything, and God truly knows our heart. So our second outline is God's blessing after discipline. And, and th this, this is wonderful for, us to know, wonderful for us to know that God loves us, but he has to punish us. He has to get us straight. But 
He doesn't just leave us there. He doesn't leave us in punishment mode. He will come back. He will wrap his arms around us and let, let us know that he still loves us. So, verses 17 through 24. Shall not Lebanon in a very little while become a fruitful field, and the fruitful field be regarded as a forest? On that day the deaf shall hear the words of a scroll, and out of their gloom and darkness the eyes of the blind shall see. Now how many of you know that we can be deaf not because we're physically deaf, but because we are spiritually deaf? And God has to open our ears so that we can hear. We can be spiritually blind as opposed to physically blind. And God has to open our eyes so I can hear, so we can see. Otherwise, we walk around as if things are okay until we find out that God is not pleased with what we are doing. So we have to keep our, our physical eyes separated from our spiritual eyes. We need to look deeply into what God has prepared for us through his word and through his prophets. The meek shall obtain fresh joy in the Lord, and the neediest people shall exult in the Holy One of Israel. Let's say that again. The meek shall obtain fresh joy in the Lord. Imagine getting fresh joy, that, that the Lord has revealed himself once again to you in a new way that makes you excited, makes you want to scream, make you want to jump, make you want to holler, and, and just rejoice that God truly has not forgotten you. But we have to remember that we get caught up in useless rituals. And I'm going to get to that in just a minute. But it says, For the tyrant, which is Satan, shall be no more, and the scoffer shall cease to be. All those alert to do evil shall be cut off. So that's letting you know that God loves us. God may allow us to go into captivity. He, may, uh, he might allow us to suffer certain things, but he, he would not forget us. He will come back and rescue us every time. We know this because he has told us this in the foundation of his word. He has given us example after example of his great love for us. It says, those who cause a person to lose a lawsuit, who set a trap for the arbiter in the gate and without grounds deny justice to the one in the right. So imagine you have a lawyer that goes into court and the lawyer doesn't do their, his or her best to win your case. That's just not right. That's why you pay them to give them your, for them to give their best defense for you. It says, therefore, thus says the Lord, who redeemed Abraham concerning the house of Jacob. No longer shall Jacob be ashamed. No longer shall his face grow pale. And we know that uh, Jacob was considered a trickster. And when he came to know the Lord, he asked God to change my name. No longer do I want to be a trickster. For when he sees his children, the work of my hands in his midst, they will sanctify my name. They will sanctify the Holy One of Jacob and will stand in the awe of the God of Israel. We will sanctify his name. We will have an unashamed witness and an unashamed praise. We will let everybody know about the glory of God and just how much we love him. Verse 24. And those who err in spirit will come to understanding, and those who grumble will accept instruction. So when we do things uh, contrary to God's will, when we uh, do things that are, are, is wrong and out of fellowship, that the Lord will bring us back. He will allow us to come back. Uh, when we think of the prodigal son, uh, how he asked his father, you know, give me all my inheritance. I, I want to go out into the world and be my own man. But when he went out into the world and enjoyed all that riotous living and spent all he had, and he ended up in the hog pen, and then, then he came to himself. So, brothers and sisters, I beseech you, don't end up in the hog pen of life before you understand the joy of the Lord and his love for us. It, it doesn't have to always be that uh, we've done something wrong that we know of. Because there are sometimes we walk into things that we don't know that is wrong. But we suffer those consequences. So we need to reach out to the Lord. 
we need to pray and ask God to reveal who we are so that we'll know. Because sometimes we have things that's deep and hidden inside of us that we don't even realize. So if we ask God to show himself to us through his eyes, then he certainly will. And I wanted to talk to you about useless rituals. We have rituals. Uh, how many of you go to church and you see somebody raise their finger and bow their head as they tip out? I was, I was an adult before I knew what that meant. I just know that we were supposed to do it. And I found out that that's how the slaves alerted the master that they had to go out to use the restroom. So we don't have to do that anymore. God is our master. He has released us from that useless ritual. How many of you hear your pastor say, touch your neighbor? Well, during COVID, we haven't been able to touch our neighbor. So that was a useless ritual. We just need to touch God. God is our savior. Also, uh, I remember when I was in college, my professor said, he had an experience where he was walking across campus and he said to someone, hello, how are you? And kept walking. And the gentleman that he spoke to was from a foreign country. And a gentleman came back and touched him on the shoulder and said, excuse me, sir, you Americans bother me when you say, hello, how are you? Because you really don't want to know. Because you asked me how was I doing and you kept right on walking. And it gave my professor a moment to pause and think what the gentleman said was so true. And we do God like that. We say, hey God, how you doing? And we keep right on walking. So God wants us to find out how he's doing. He wants us to pause in our daily lives, take time to find out how he's doing. Because he's always seeking to find out how we're doing. So let's search our hearts and, and just take some time to, to think about rituals that we do that may be useless. You ever see people in your church who the music start praying and they start running? They start jumping, they start shouting. That could be a useless ritual. I'm not saying they're, they're, that they're not truly touched, they're not truly moved, because sometimes I feel like jumping and shouting and running. But you've seen that person every Sunday. Time the music start, they jump up and they run around the church. So if that's you, Definitely check it, check yourself. Look into your heart and see what that is about, is about. Are you truly serving God? Do you truly feel a connection with God? Or is that lip service that you're giving, just empty lip service, something for show? So we have to be very careful that we don't do things just for show. So make sure that we continue to love God, that we eliminate useless rituals, and that we always make sure that we give God the praise and honor that he deserves. Thank you so much for tuning in to our Sunday School broadcast. I certainly hope it blesses you. And thank you, Brother Dorsey, for letting me uh, stand in your stead today. And I will see you all next time. Oh, somebody.